Maybe that's what he said it was. Text him real quick. I think that's it. Hallelujah. Welcome to Wednesday night service at Abundant Grace Church. Glad you guys are here in person. You guys are joining us via live stream as well. So are we ready to worship the Lord? You know, I say this, I haven't said it in a couple weeks, but I'm going to put us in, re in remembrance that it's important that we prepare our hearts for worship, right? What does that mean? We got to erase anything that went down today. You know, when we come out to like a Sunday service, Hopefully it's early in the morning, your day hasn't gone sideways, maybe not as much going on, but 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, after a full day of whatever's going on, you know, sometimes we need that extra dose of needing to clear our minds, get everything out of the way, and then just prepare our hearts for worship. Amen? Amen. So glory to God. Let's stand on our feet, and let's sing this song to the risen King. Amen? Focus on him. Focus on Jesus. Right? That's, and his desire is to speak to you during praise and worship. So listen up. You know, we don't want to just sing, we want to listen up. Amen. Right? And sometimes we forget that because in the middle of going through something, we feel like he's not, he he's not there. We're not hearing from God. 
but we're the ones so often blocking the reception. You know, Brother Keith Moore said this one time when he was ministering here, that he, it's like a radio station. Continue, God is continually broadcasting. But the reality is we're not fine-tuning the radio station. You know, last week when we looked at the loin belt of truth and the armor of God, that everything hinges, everything's tied to, everything's attached to the Word of God. And if we shrink back, we fail to spend time in it, and then we try to expect to hear from God, how often does he talk to us through the word? Every day, if we allow it. But that's on us, right? God is always broadcasting, amen? Why? He's faithful to watch over his word and perform it. That's what he's going to perform. His will, his word, amen? Glory to God. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. As he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. Everybody, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all we'll see how great, how great is our God.
that? Do you believe he's great? Amen. Glory to God. He is great. He is great. Worthy to be praised, right? Glory to God. I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? My knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, Lord. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine oh, yeah. Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Can we imagine? But, you know, 
eventually, the shortest thing we're ever going to do is live here on Earth, right? The reality is we're going to spend eternity in heaven. And really, that song's talking about seeing Jesus face to face. But can we imagine what Jesus wants for us right now here on the Earth? We have to. We don't have to imagine it, though. It's not a wishing and a hoping. It's looking into the Word and knowing what's ours. Amen? So you guys may be seated. We worship the Lord with our... Um, thanks, George. Worship the Lord with our song and our praise, and we're going to continue to do that with our giving. So if you guys need uh, an offering envelope, raise up your hand. Art will make sure you get one. And I'm not going to beleaguer the offering tonight because I know everybody in here is a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. Ready to give, happy to give, honoring God, doing it with a heart to please him. Amen. Amen. And know that that's God's plan, that's God's will, and that's God's promise, is that he's going to what? Show us, teach us, mold us, shape us in living abundantly in our giving. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So we ready to give? Yes. All right, let's pray. Hold your offering up. Make the devil a little angry. Makes him angry. Why? Because he knows that's going to advance the kingdom. And he's not happy about kingdom advancement. Amen? That makes us happy, right? Glory to God. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom, the privilege of it. Your word says that as we sow, you will give back to us, Lord, 30, 60, and 100-fold, running over, Father, cups running over with overflow so that we can't hoard it up. We don't need to hoard it up for ourselves. We have plenty to save and plenty to give, right? Nothing lacking, nothing broken kind of lifestyle in our own lives and plenty to save and give to others, Father, because that is Jesus' hands and feet. That's Jesus at work, and people will see that in us. You know, we don't want to, we, our desire as givers is not to be that type of giver that says, hey, I'll pray for you if you have a need. Well, I'll pray for you, but I want to help you. Jesus wants to help you. And that's our heart's desire when we give. And as we give into good ground here at Abundant Grace Church, and as we sow it as we're directed, and we know it will produce because it is good ground. And seed produces after its own kind. So as you give, expect the return of the seed you sow. Expect. Expectancy. We need to expect, and we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for teaching us by your word tonight. We come together and join our faith and release it to hear from you. Fresh revelation. We know, Lord, revelation is progressive. I say this every week. We do not want to have an attitude of I've heard that before. God wants to do a new thing tonight. He wants to show us through his word, and, Lord, we're believing you for that. We're believing you for nuggets of truth, things we've never seen before, those aha moments, Lord where we finally see it crystal clear. And we thank you for it all. We say bring glory to yourself this evening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Glory to God. So glad you guys are here. Um, what I did want to do, turn if you have your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. I do want to do a little quick review. Because as I was studying out us moving along a little further, last week we looked at the loin belt of truth, and we looked at the blessed breastplate, I always say blessed plate, but it is a blessed plate. It's a blessed plate of righteousness because we were blessed to be righteous. And we received that righteousness by no work of our own, right? It was a free gift of grace. And I want to look at just things a little bit deeper because as I, I started to look at for tonight's message, you know, I really wanted to try to maybe cover two weapons mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6. But guys, there is so much. I said to Jody on the way over, and we're not going to do this, so I know we've been spending a lot of weeks on this, but you could spend weeks just on one of the weapons if you really wanted to. And as I started to, sh to study out the shoes of peace, it became more and more clear that what we looked at last week, I just wanted to reinforce some points. In Ephesians chapter 6, um, I don't want to start, start at the top of the, of the chapter. Let's start in verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in who? The Lord. Should we be strong in our own understanding? Should we lean on our own understanding? Is so often, when we, especially when we look at the shoes of peace, when we get outside of peace, we're 
have a tendency to be dictated by our mind, our will, and emotions. So the last person we should ever lean on, we never should anyway, is us. Because when we're dictated by our mind, will, and emotions, they let us down and betray us every time. I feel something, therefore I act. Well, we say, feelings are real. We don't deny them, but feelings betray us. Feelings often are an emotion caused by the enemy whispering a falsehood in our ear, making us react to a situation that's not real. You know, if you're dealing with sickness, illness, and disease tonight, if you're dealing with financial lack of any kind, guess what that is? That's a lie. That's not God's best. That's not God's will. So therefore, if he tells you it doesn't look good, you're not going to make it, you're going under, that's a lie. The truth is what the word says, that he'll meet all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We just prayed that during our offering. If we're givers and our hearts are right, and God doesn't care about the amounts, it's about the heart. You know, we always go back to this scripture because scripture, it's a glaring um, representation of how Jesus perceives our giving. The woman with the two mites. Two mites was insignificant in the natural for what she gave. But when you look at the percentages, you know, you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees bragging about how they tied the, their money, their, 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 their harvest, great. But if you've got a billion dollars and give a million, but if you have only two mites and you give two mites, did you give God not only your best, not only you gave your best, you gave it all, and then said that that's like saying to God, and Jesus was watching, right? He was watching, you know, not to judge. He was watching to, wow, she gave everything. What does that show? She trusts. She trusts God, right? So be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. We talked about his wilds, his lies, his trickery, Right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It may feel like we're wrestling with people at times, but the influence behind those people we feel like we're wrestling with is not the people themselves. They're being deceived. The word tells us that Satan has the eyes of the unsaved blinded to the truth of the gospel. Now you're going to say, but the person I'm struggling with is a believer, right? Who's yielding to the enemy. Kind of the same thing. That person may know the truth. You know, I'm not saying they've lost their salvation, but the reality is they can be influenced by giving into what the enemy's chirping in their ear. You know, I'm pretty sure in my this is 2023, 16, 17, 18 years, really about 18 years of turning my life back over to God, I've probably said something to a believer influenced by the enemy. Just keeping it real, especially those early years, you know, when I had one foot in, one foot out. I'm sure I did, you know, because I was trying to convince other Christians that, hey, my way's better, you know. We, we could do this. Pastor Radio always calls, we always say, Side business. We can do a little side business. <laughs> the funny business, you know. You're either in, you're out. It's that simple, right? So the reality is our struggle is not with people, but rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We talked about that. Don't get all funky about it. You know, the heavenly places right here. The first heaven, right above us, right? That's where the spiritual warfare is. We don't have to go to the Empire State Building and do, or fly in a helicopter or a plane at, you know, near, near the outer space limit you touch there and do spiritual warfare. The higher you get, ain't going to increase your ability to do spiritual warfare. It's just not. Okay? People got funky about that. And then we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal right? But mighty to God for the pulling down of strongholds. 
Okay, we looked at three specific words, weapons, warfare, not carnal. For the sake of time, we're not gonna go back. You can review those either online on Facebook or, or YouTube channel. Everything is recorded in there. So, verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I love this verse of scripture. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. I firmly believe, and I, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us this, but when Paul said, do, when you've done all to stand, stand. We're going to have to do some double time, double standing. You know, because you're going to stand and you're going to feel like you got knocked down. And it's funny because I was watching that, a little bit of Rocky Balboa the other night. And this line, although it's a secular line, it's not Bible, but it reminded me of this scripture, right? It's not about how often you get knocked up, but get how you get up and keep moving forward. What? Or not knock down, knock down, but get up and moving forward. What does that mean? When I've done all the stand, stand. You've got to be like a weeble, right? Remember weebles wobble? They don't fall down. Or remember, I, I, as a kid growing up, I'm aging myself, I had one of those Superman things. That's us. When we've done all the stand, stand there for. But God didn't leave us unequipped to do so. Quite honestly, he's left us more than fully equipped. We're actually overly equipped, right? Or if there could be such thing, we're over-equipped to stand against anything. First of all, the victory is ours. We've already won. We don't have to win anything. We just need to stand through what the enemy tries to bring while we're waiting on the manifestation of what we're believing God for. So, uh, Ms. Carol, did you... Tom, did you show Miss Carol where that picture is? So we looked at this guy, and unfortunately, I couldn't find a really good picture of the shoes. But we talked about the loin belt, right? The loin belt is a representation of the Word of God. And you can't really see it there. And we talked about looking at this Roman soldier, right, maybe similar to what Paul was seeing. Would our eyes, are our eyes drawn to that belt? Like, hey, he's got a nice belt. You know, the only way I see a belt on a guy, it's got to be like a rodeo rider wearing one of those giant belt buckles. And if you guys watch Heartland, you know what we're talking about, right? Everybody's walking around those giant rodeo belt buckle things, right? And that you might see, but there's nothing super special about that belt. It was a leather belt. But as a representation of the Word of God, every single piece of the armor was attached to it. Now, he's holding the shield at his side ready for battle. But when you're not ready, when the Roman soldier wasn't ready for battle, that thing was heavy. He couldn't carry it around all day. So there was a hook on it where he could hook the shield and take the weight off. So the shield was hooked to the, um, the, the belt, the loin belt. The sword had the sheath on the loin belt. The, breast, the breastplate was attached to the loin belt so it wouldn't fly up. It's central to, if, if you don't put the loin belt on, if you don't spend time in the Word of God and know what's yours in Christ, what belongs to you, what his will is, the weapons that God has given us are useless. It all, every single that other one that comes after the loin belt. And Paul didn't make a mistake when he listed the loin belt of truth first. It's central to everything. If we don't know the Word, we're not in the Word, the other weapons are completely and totally useless. And I wanted to reinforce that tonight because as we look at the shoes of peace, you're going to be like, well, what do shoes have to do with the loin belt? They're not attached. Yes, but the shoes of peace, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, are both an offensive and a defensive weapon. And in order to use them properly, we have to be rooted and grounded in the word of God right? And then we looked at uh, two different words from God, uh, specifically logos and rhema. Logos is the written word itself, and rhema is a fresh, specifically quick and revealed word for us for a situation, right? You're praying in the Holy Ghost. I use that example, and all of a sudden, a scripture to stand on rises up on the inside of you. That's a rhema-type word from God. 
Logos is the entire word of God in its entirety itself, right? And look at the breastplate. Breastplate was a beautiful piece of armor, magnificent to behold, uh, usually um, brass more than anything. It was made out of uh, two sheets of metal front and back because the enemy likes to do what? On the backside, sneak attack. All of a sudden, out of nowhere. Didn't see it coming, right? But again, attached to what? The loin belt. Why? So in battle, as the, as the uh, soldier would swing his weaponry, his shield, his sword, there's another piece of weaponry we're going to look at that most people don't know is part of the armor. We'll get to that last. But as he's fighting, that would fly up if it wasn't attached, and he'd lose protection, right? We talked about chinks of armor. Right? Even the best made armor, the most you can cover yourself with armor, had a place where you were vulnerable. So to not have a vulnerable, not have ourselves vulnerable to attack, we need to what? That breastplate of righteousness that was a free gift from God needs to be attached to the loin belt of truth. Because we, people can get funky. Christians can get funky about their righteousness. Do you ever hear righteous indignation? I'm just going to say, I'm not, I don't have anybody in mind. I'm just thinking about this experience-wise. Have you ever meant, have you ever met a cocky Christian that was like so full of like their own righteous, their own righteousness, thinking they were full with God's righteousness that you just wanted to be like, can I hit you over the head with the breastplate of righteousness? Judgmental, pride. Instead of walking in love, it's walking in pride, anger, judgmentalism, but yet they're righteous. Well, you were righteous the day you got saved, and you can't be any more righteousness. But we talked about that specific piece of armor. The more the, it was beautiful to begin with and shiny, but the more the soldier wore it, and the plates like scales, because they were interwoven like scales, rubbed together, the shinier it got. And what does that mean? The more we walk in our righteousness, the God kind of righteousness, right, doing things his way, right, not leaning on our own understanding, following his will for our life, right, God's right way of doing things, that gets shinier and shinier. What does that mean? People will see it. People will see it and be drawn to it. And again, you put your life on example, sometimes, if not all the time, it's, it shows through more than hitting people over the head with the Bible, which we don't do anyway, right? They just see you living through a situation, and they're like, man, how can you do that? How can you keep your peace with what you're going through? What is that? Your righteousness just shining through. Why? Because you're wearing it. You're fighting in it. You're fighting with it. And the more you do, the shinier and shinier, the more you use it, the shinier it gets. Amen. Glory to God. All right. So that's kind of where we left off last week. Can we look at the shoes of peace? Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find a really good picture. A lot of the illustrations of, that I saw online, and I didn't do a ton of research. I thought I had that in that picture, and then I did a last-minute thing, aren't a true representation of what Paul was looking at. Um, they were a little bit more elaborate than a lot of the things you would see online. I just want to read this because I was, again, doing the research. So the Roman soldier's shoes were not ordinary shoes. They were made from bronze, brass, usually more, more than likely brass, and were composed of two parts. Now, I want to read this, go back and read the scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, because I want you to specifically underline three words in your Bible. And it says, and having shod your feet, underline that word shod, with the preparation, underline preparation, and it's okay to write in your Bible, God's not going to hit you over the head with anything. <laughs> it shows that you're paying attention and you want to go back and review some stuff. Of the gospel of peace, and underline peace. So we have a two-piece shoe. Now the first piece, which you can't see in that picture, is what are called the greaves. The greaves were shin armor, right? Shin armor that started just below the soldier's knee so he could use his knee unhindered and covered all the way around his calf and his shin and hooked in to the top of the shoe. It's important. Remember I said 
the shoes a piece are offensive and defensive, right? And then the shoes, that, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read the way it was actually explained out because it, it kind of makes it a little clearer. The greave was a tube-like piece of bronze that began at the top of the knee, extended down the leg to the upper foot, causing it to look like the soldier's boots were made of metal, right? And the shoe itself was made from two pieces of metal. The top and the bottom were covered in the metal and the sides were held together with multiple pieces of leather. And on the bottom of the shoes were equipped with extremely dangerous spikes. Not all the time, if they specifically were going into battle. The, sp the spikes were typically or normally about an inch, but if they went, which, what did that do? It provided footing and traction. If you ever played a sport, you know, cleats, same gig, right? I was thinking about that as I was studying this, that sometimes, and you'll see this if you're like an NFL you know, fan, it just happened in the Super Bowl, right? People were slipping, so they had to go from a one-inch cleat to a one-and-a-half or two-inch cleat, right? Well, in warfare, they went from a one-inch cleat that they wore kind of like every day for traction to a three-inch spike. But these were spikes, not cleats. Gene Simmons, right. Exactly. They were spikes. Now, did I say the, the shoes of peace? Now, when, do you really think about peace? First of all, peace having to do with some sort of offensive weapon that's really that dangerous? But it's important. It's an offensive and defensive weapon. So they had spikes on the bottom. Can you kick somebody with a bronze sh shoe? You're darn right you could. And could, would, could you hit them with those greaves? Like give them a little shin action? Or, but were they also there to protect you? Two-way piece, piece, P-I-E-C, of, of weaponry, right? So these spikes could be as long as three inches for combat. I was, I was doing a little, some of this that I looked at actually came out and I told you guys up front, uh, Rick Renner's book, right? Dress to Kill, right? And he literally calls them killer shoes. They were killer shoes. You know, so when you kind of look at these things and how dangerous they were, would we really just, it made me kind of wonder, like why Paul was using them to describe peace. Like maybe the helmet should have been peace. You know, you put it over your head, you feel good. But he's got these like dangerous ready to kill shoes as peace. But again, peace is offensive and defensive. It not only protects us, but it provides us with a brutal weapon when the enemy attacks us. If we use this weapon correctly, it will keep uh, spiritual foes under our feet. Think about this. Three-inch combat spikes on the bottom of the shoes of peace. Romans 16, 20, you don't have to turn there, it says this. And I didn't, I didn't make this correlation. I've never made this correlation. And again, revelation is progressive. And that's my prayer every time before I, I minister is that the revelation I got is also a fresh revelation for you guys. Because I never saw the shoes of peace as the offensive side. I always thought about it as more of a defensive side, right? And Romans 16, 20 says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Now, he's already been defeated, shortly meaning you're just waiting on the manifestation of your victory, but where's his rightful place? What's, what's on the bottom of your feet, spiritually speaking, in warfare? Three inch killer spikes. So when you, if you'd like me in the morning and remind him that he's my footstool and he's under my feet, now I'm gonna remind him with, hey, I got three inch spikes. How does that feel, pal? Killer, killer, peace is a killer to him. Protector to us and a killer to him. Now, I told you those three words. The first word in the verse of scripture says, the, having shod your feet. Shod is a Greek compound word meaning under and bind. 
okay? Taken together, it conveys the idea of binding something very tightly on the bottom of one's feet, right? So we got to put peace on pretty tight, right? We need to tighten up our peace. We have to cultivate, though, a lifestyle of peace. I'm going to look at why that is in a second because there's two, there's two versions of peace that we need to really kind of be aware of, and many do the first and think the first covers the second, and it doesn't. So hang on to that thought, right? But we have to cultivate a lifestyle of firmly tying peace around our lives, our mind, our will, and emotions. What did I say earlier? What's the enemy's sole purpose? To steal, kill, or destroy, right? He wants to steal everything you have. He wants to physically kill you, and he wants to steal your legacy, right? Any, anybody you could have touched if you fulfilled the call on your life. And everybody is called to a call. Right? I say this all the time. It doesn't mean it has to be the five-fold ministry. We've all been called to, to and I don't, even mean, I don't mean to say it this way to belittle it, at least the ministry of reconciliation, but that's not least. That's the most important, right? We've all been called to the ministry of reconciliation. There's people in your circles I will never meet or touch. Pastor Eddie will never meet. My wife, Melissa, Miss Carol, whoever ministers from this pulpit will never reach. But do you realize, and we said this when we started last week, that the armor of God is for us to fight spiritual battles. Yes, for our own life, but everything we do for our own life should be with a focus on for people. It's about people. You fight battle. The battle you're fighting today, you might say, how does my health battle have to do with people? Everything. How does my financial battle have to do with people? Everything. Why? Because the word of that testimony shows the goodness of God. That's why it still makes me want to, when people say, well, it's not God's will to heal. He's, he's wanting me sick. That glorifies him. How? Please tell me how. Because that's not a God I want to be associated with. Same thing with poverty. Jesus was poor. Yeah, he needed a treasure. He had, had his head asleep in a ship in a storm on a leather pillow. Do you think that was inexpensive in Jesus' day? A leather pillow to sleep in a storm. How does a broke Christian glorify God? Just like we prayed during the offering. Oh, I'm sorry, man, you got a need. I feel for you. Let me pray for you. Okay, I mean, and don't get me wrong. If that's what you have... You pray for them. Stand together. Believe together. Power and agreement, right? But everything we do, every battle we fight isn't just about us. I said this earlier. I think I said this on the last Sunday message I did, talking about seeking the kingdom. Too many believers are seeking, are seeking God, Matthew 6, 33, for the advancement of their own kingdom. And God's in the people business. He was the first human resources department. Amen? So, Shod, tie something tightly to the bottom of one's feet. The other word we looked at, was wanted to look at, was preparation. It's a Greek word which conveys the idea of solidity, firmness, or a solid foundation. This is the action of peace in our lives, which is a firm footing. Just like, let's say, the smaller spikes on the bottom, not that the three-inch ones wouldn't, give you a firm foundation. It might even be a little difficult to move around, to be honest with you. you know. But those one-inch spikes, those guys were not losing traction anywhere. You know, even if you do historical look at some of the combat shoes of the American military, if you go back to like the Civil War, if you look at the Civil War, his Union soldier shoes on the bottom were little round nubs that were all over the whole bottom of the shoe. Good illustration is you ever saw the movie Glory? Good illustration because there's a part in there about shoes, right? And you see these nubs on the bottom of the shoes that were literally for traction, you know? And now that's Civil War. You know, I don't know if they had anything like that. I don't think they had anything back like in the Revolution days, but certainly moving up, they did, right? 
So preparation, Greek word, conveys the idea of solidity, firmness, solid foundation. It's the action of peace in our lives, which is a firm footing. Peace gives us a foundation so secure. Peace gives us a foundation so secure that we can step out in faith without being moved by what we see. We need that. We need that because if you're going to step out in faith and do what God's called you to do, you better have peace because not to, to speak this over anybody, I'm talking from my own life. I'm talking to some things that are going on right now because we've stepped out and done what God's called us to do. And things just are like, huh? Who? What? Really? Why? But we need peace. Should we be moved by anything the enemy tries to? Why? What does the word say? Take it back to the loin belt. Take it back to the loin belt. What does the word say? What is the truth? What's the truth? But pastor, I'm dealing with sickness. What's the truth say? By his stripes, I'm healed. Jesus himself took my infirmities to the cross. By his stripes, I'm healed. But I don't feel good. Me either sometimes. What does that mean? That's the lie. The truth is, by his stripes, I'm healed. And that gives me what? The truth of the word, of the loin belt, gives me peace and the ability to use those shoes with those three-inch spikes on them. It's that simple. We make it complicated, but it's really not complicated, right? And I told us we wanted to look at the last word was peace itself. That is not, you might be surprised by this, but that word peace that Paul uses when he writes Ephesians chapter 6 is not the word shalom. It's a different word. It's the same word when he starts all but two of his greetings in the books he's written in the Bible, grace and peace. And then he reverses it in twice to peace and grace. But the reality is it's the same word that he uses in his greetings. Peace in this particular verse of scripture is the Greek word meaning a peace that prevails or a conquering peace. It's also, like I said, the same word that Paul uses reversed in those, not reversed in the greetings, but it's the same word, not shalom. What does it say? When we get the loin belt of truth, the word of God in our hearts, it brings us peace. But what kind of peace does the word tell us it brings us? Scripture tells us it brings us the peace that surpasses all understanding. You're confronted with life and death. Really, we're in a battle for our life every day. We not, may not think that, but the devil's sole desire is to take you out every day. Well, really? Doesn't he just want to? No, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he just want to mess with He just want to mess with you. He wants you dead. If not today, much earlier than you should have. Okay. Now, the good news is you're going to go home to be with the Lord, but there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that hurts my heart more than a believer that goes home to be with the Lord too soon. Right? Can I share a bit of what you shared with me on Sunday? Tom? Tom had given his testimony in the special service that we did for bikers, but he was talking to me and Jody on Sunday. And what you didn't share it that night, though, what we talked about. When he was laying on the ground after the accident, he was semi-conscious. We don't even, you were actually unconscious, right? Semi-conscious? Semi-conscious. And crawled himself up to, like, the curb, and God was or an angel or it was a worker, a, a medic, and Tom was out of it, and Tom had a feeling like, basically, like you were going home to be with the Lord, and things were peaceful, and it felt like a euphoria, you said, right? And then Tom said, but wait, I'm not finished yet. Whether you go home prematurely, it's our choice. But what do we need to get, what do we need to get a hold of first? The loin belt, the loin belt, the truth, the word, the word. Truth brings us peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. If we've lost our peace in life, don't be quick to assume it's the devil 
or it's somebody else doing it to you. Because the first place you need to go is the mirror. Did you open the door to it? Because it might be the enemy working, but did you open the door? And it could be subtle. Nothing done maliciously. Let me give you an example. Something that might seem subtle. Something that you may be like, I didn't, I didn't think it was sin. If you look back, you know, you go to the doctor, the first thing they ask you is, what's your medical history? I don't want to give it because it's like, well, what did your mother and father die from? And what did you, and I'm like, what does that matter? Well, we need to know. If you've ever, though, kind of looked back and said, well, you know, my, my parents both had this, or my uncle, or my grandparents, and you meditate on it, what did you do? You open the door. And it's so subtle. And you might not think, well, it's not. It's the devil bringing sickness. Yeah, who let him in? And we open the door. We've all been guilty of it at one time in one area. It happens. That's how sneaky, crafty, deceitful he is. But the reality is we don't have to do that. But if things are going haywire and you feel like you've lost your peace, look in the mirror. You know, years ago when I first started coming to the church, we had the Man in the Mirror conference. Remember that one? With the T-shirts that you can only read, they were backwards. So if you read them in the mirror, you could read it. Right? I have that around. I'm probably somewhere still. Right? Why? Because that's where we need to start. Anything going haywire in your life, you got to start there. Do I need to close something? And I pray this every morning. Lord, is there a door open you need me to shut? Because if I'm missing it, I need to know. And we might, we're, we're not missing it on purpose. We, you, first of all, it might not even be something you even have light on. But if you ask him to show you, he's going to show you. But how? Through the loin belt of truth, his word. Or a rhema word, right, that just comes up on the inside and says, hey, check this scripture out, right? If you lost your peace, look in the mirror. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's two kinds of peace. Many believers have no problem with number one, like I said. But they think number one covers number two and it doesn't. Number one is peace. This is important we get this right. Peace with God. Let me explain to you what that is. It's what every person that comes to the Lord for salvation first experiences. The old man's put off, the new life begins. That experience that you're saved, you're going to heaven, you're, you're right with God, that's the peace of God or the peace with God, rather, the peace with God. Colossians for, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says this, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace, we have scripture that says this, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet know he has been reconciled. So that's peace with God. Let me use a simple illustration of that. Can anybody talk you out of your salvation? Peace with God, right? But pastor, I got to be honest with you. And, and look, I've been here myself, so I'm calling myself out. I, I struggle sometimes with believing God for finances. So you have peace with God. What we lack is the second peace, which is the peace of God. They're different. What's the peace of God? And again, you can have the, the peace of God. You can have the peace with God without experiencing the peace of God. People know that they're secure in their salvation. However, they continue to walk in constant fear, doubt, and worry about other areas of God's will for their lives. But yet the peace of God is the protective peace. Why? Because if you're experiencing lack, 
but you know what's yours in Christ? And you know what God's will is for lack, for sickness, for relationships, for everything that is, you know, that, you, that every promise in the word? And if you know it's yours, then you can have peace about it. You get a bad doctor's report. That's not the report. This is the report. The final report is the word of God. And you can, you can look a doctor straight in the face who tells you it's stage four, and go, okay, what's next? Because why? You know that you have the peace of God. Are your mind, will, and emotions still going to go haywire? Heck yeah. Then what do we need to do? Take it back to the loin belt and do what? Take those thoughts captive. Unto what? The obedience of Christ. How do we do that? We look at the, the lie from the enemy that says this is going to take you out. We bring it back to the word, the truth, right? And say, no, that's not what my, that's not what my declaration pages say. That's not what I'm covered for. I'm covered for divine health and healing. I'm covered for prosperity of all times. And what does that do? When you know the word, the word brings the peace of God, not just peace with God, secure salvation, which is awesome, but God wanted more. He wanted you to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. F.F. F. Bosworth in his, and I talked about this the other day in Faith and Healing School on Friday. F.F. F. Bosworth in his book, Christ the Healer, had this statement. Uh, faith begins when the will of God is known or where the will of God is known. And guess what? Faith and peace if we're truly in faith, faith and peace will always walk hand in hand. Will always walk hand in hand. I just said the peace of God is a protective peace. Colossians 3.15 says this, and let the peace of, of God, not the peace with God, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called into one body and be thankful. We need the protective peace of God because we're, if we're, like I said earlier, if we're going to fulfill the assignments that God's given us, we're going to be in need of peace because we're going to be going through some rocky and difficult situations. And I'm not saying that to, like I said, to speak it over everybody. It's fact. Step out in faith for God and what he's telling you to do and buckle up. Buckle up. Why? You're a threat to him. You're a threat to him. And again, because it's not just about you. It's about everybody out there you can touch for God. We have the truth. We have the truth. We'll need the protection of peace. Amen? That's as far as we're going to get tonight. We have a little more to go. Not much, a little bit, really a little bit more. But... um. Next week, we're going to get into the shield of faith. Amen? Amen. Praise, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, Father, pointing us in a direction to change. Thank you, Father, for your will and your plan of redemption through Christ and what it's provided for, for us. Wholeness, completeness and the ability to stand against every single work of darkness with peace and joy, knowing that you've provided victory. And we thank you for it all. We say bring glory to yourself this evening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Glory to God. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, you guys as well on live stream. We look forward to seeing you. Don't forget, other services. Tomorrow, women's meeting, 6 p.m. Come out for that, and I think that pickleball after. It's the first of the month. Or beginning of the month, um, Faith and Healing School tomorrow and Friday, 10.30 a.m., and Sunday service, 10 a.m. So we love you guys. Have an awesome rest.